Hi there and welcome. Welcome to the Time of the Writer Festival on this uh, on this day five of the Time of the Writer Festival. Lovely to have you with us and uh, welcome to you all festival goers and to our panellists. Um, let, me, let me start by telling you that this is the cocktail hour and if you haven't got a little drink with you, hopefully you're about to go and get one. And what we're going to be looking at in the next hour is we're going to be talking about teaching reconciliation in schools. Our three panelists, all of whom have a, a great passion for this, each in their various ways, so it'll be really interesting. They have not just passion, but a lot of experience in it, so it'll be very interesting to hear what they have to say. It will equally be very interesting to hear what you have to say, so if you have anything that you'd like to share with us, there's a little chat box at the bottom, um, there's also the Q&A, so if you'd like to send your questions into the Q&A, we will do our very best to address them. Um, so our panellists are Cindy Wemagona, the lovely Cindy Wemagona with her head wrap, Bobby Rodwell, and going to be joining us very soon is Yvette Hardy. I'm going to be introducing, you them, uh, introducing them a little bit more fully to you in just a minute. But um, it's my pleasure right now to tell you, because without, without the funders and the partners, there would be no festival. And I think we all have to be extremely grateful for having things online, for the ability to do this, which keeps the word alive, it keeps the thoughts alive, and it keeps the concepts alive. So thank you very much to the time of the rest, uh, the time of the writer festival, but also to their funders and partners who are uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal, the National Department of Arts and Culture, the KZN Department of Arts and Culture, the French Institute of South Africa, the Stand Foundation, the Foundation for Human Rights the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as the Amazwi Museum for South African Literature. Our media partner is Imbiza, Journal for African Writing, and the technical partner is Hear My Voice, who have been doing a sterling job. So thanks to them all. And thanks to you for joining us. And I think that, uh, I think it's really important to be looking at what's coming up in the younger generation. So I think this is a particularly important conversation to be having. So let me introduce you to our revered guests who are She's not with us yet, but I'm going to tell you all about Yvette Hardy, who is a multidisciplinary person. She is a theatre director, producer, educator and advocate, focusing specifically on theatre for young audiences, both locally and abroad. She initiated the launch of and is director of something called ACITEJ South Africa, which is the International Association of Theatre for Children and Young People, of which she's also international president at the moment. And she has her own company, which is called Free Voice Productions. It's an independent theatre company committed to producing work that speaks to the core of what it means to be human in a complex and challenging world. And with Human Rights Day coming up on Sunday, I think that could not be more important. Cindy Wimagona almost needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it once again because it's my pleasure. She is both an activist and an author. I'm not sure in which order those come, but she's author primarily in this particular instance of a, a work called Mother to Mother, which was not just a book uh, written in 19 or published in 1998. It also went on to become a set work for schools. Um, and in, also in consequence, it became a documentary which reveals a great deal. She's written well over 120 pieces um, and among, in fact, she's just about to release another one, which is very exciting. I think it's coming out very soon. So we look forward to that. And her oeuvre includes books for adults, for young people, plays, poetry. She is multi-awarded with honorary doctorates here, there and everywhere. And also the order of Ikamanga. So a big round of applause to you, lovely Sindiwe. And her passion or one of her passions is the uplifting of young people to find their power and their purpose. And she does that in each and every opportunity possible. Bobby, Bo Bobby Rodwell has been also working in theater, in documentary film and radio. She's another one of these multidisciplinary people for the past two decades, both as a producer, writer, focusing specifically on socio-political issues uh, right across the continent. She believes in using personal testimony in theater for social change. And interestingly, and we'll be touching on this, the piece that she created, the story I am about to tell, was based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, through which she learned a great deal, and hopefully she's going to be sharing something of that. She's currently funder and a director of a company called Mechlo Maya, which means eye to the sun, about which we also hope to hear a little bit more, because in itself it's an interesting story. Um, it's a film company, but it's also proof of the work that writers do in the theatre space. So welcome to you all. Welcome, Yvette. Nice to have you with us. Obviously a busy girl. Thank you, Nancy. Great, great. 
So um, I'm going to start by telling you that earlier this week we spoke to we spoke about Cindy Wimagona's book play set work mother to mother around which this documentary was made, which showed very clearly how it was being used to teach reconciliation and understanding in schools amongst school children. Um, Yvette was instrumental in getting the play to young people or maybe getting young people to the play, which was in itself eye opening. And Bobby, I think you've worked at the TRC, so you have a great deal of experience. Um, Cindy, we, I didn't know, but I think that you also had some, um, some involvement in the TRC. So what I was going to start with was to sort of analyze, no, no involvement in the TRC. No worry, no worry. Nonetheless, it's where I'm going to start because the word reconciliation is a, is a very powerful word. Reconciliation implies that there's been some sort of conflict so, Bobby, having been involved in the, I mean, reconciliation is by no means a South Af exclusively South African. It's something that it's an issue the world over. But can you just tell us your involvement with the TRC back in 1996, I think it was? Just tell us what your involvement was and what your feeling about it was. Okay, um, just before I start, um, I would like to just acknowledge the creatives and artists who are staying at the National Arts Council at the moment and are meeting with the Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture on the 18th day of being in the NAC. Um, and they are going to be speaking about a badly managed COVID funding and ongoing general neglect of artists. So I just wanted to acknowledge and salute them as they're meeting with the minister as we speak. I think this is an excellent platform on which to make that acknowledgement. So thank you very much, Bobby. And I think we all feel uh, in solidarity with them. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I never worked at the TRC. Um, I did a lot of research around the TRC and um, we created the play that you referred to called The Story I'm About to Tell in 1997. So it was while the TRC was still on, it had just really started. Um, and what we did was we worked with the Kulamani support group and um, three people in the play told their own stories. Hence my journey of personal testimony. And it came about, I was going to do interviews and then write the play and then get artists to play the parts. And it was in fact, Maggie Friedman, uh, David, the late David Webster's partner um, who said, but why are you writing and getting actors to tell the stories when people can tell their own stories? So in the end, that's what we did. Three people who had been to the TRC or who were going to the TRC told their own stories in the play. And then we had three actors who um, were then scripted uh, by uh, a poet and playwright, Lesejo Rampoloke. He wrote the dialogue and that was how we created the play. So that for me was a journey of using personal testimony. Um, in using theatre for social change. For me, it's a very effective medium. I think the TRC was a catalyst for many forms of artwork. There were there was so much, so many stories that came out of it one way or another. Yvette, I know that you are also involved in a piece called Truth in Translation. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because that was also um, based around the TRC. Mm, yes. So Truth and Translation was a production that we started to research in 2000 um, and uh, we worked on it through the, the, the piece was uh, came into being around 2004, 2005. And that was when we were actually rehearsing the piece and it came to the stage in 2006 and it then toured for a number of years, not just in South Africa, but across the globe, looking specifically at conflict zones. So we, in fact, um, opened the piece in Rwanda. Um, and the idea was that wherever we were taking this piece, which told the story of the interpreters who worked at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you had to essentially say I to either the perpetrator or the victim uh, in the way they had to translate that testimony, and that we would take this play, this play to places that had experienced conflict, including our own context, of course, to start conversations about is forgiveness possible? 
what does reconciliation mean? Um, how do we reconcile uh, with one another? And so the play was, was very much a catalyst. Um, we always accompanied the play with workshops, with audiences. Many of those workshops were with young people. Um, there was very definitely a, a sort of a, a, a push to, to you know, engage with young people in different contexts. And we you know, engaged with, for example, orphans in Rwanda, some of whom had been orphaned by the, by the massacre and others who had their parents sitting in jail and working in the same space um, you know, to, to speak about the possibilities of reconciliation. And what's very interesting for me, having worked both on Mother to Mother and on Truth and Translation, is that both were telling um, the same story in a sense, but from completely uh, opposite ends of the telescope. You know, it was like you. So, we, so in terms of Mother to Mother, we are honing in in great detail into one story, one reality, um, one experience, and how reconciliation may or may not operate on, on that reality. And in Truth and Translation, we were on, in a really big scale with a number of different competing voices with no real um, sense of what was uh, the answer. There was no one answer. There were multiple truths being communicated by that cast. So it was very interesting to have both experiences. Yes, I think that it's, it's almost impossible to get single answers when we're dealing with so many different issues. But I just want to stay with the TRC for a moment. Cindy, where I know that you were in no way involved, but you were here in the country at the time. Just unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself, Cindy. Way. There you go. I am. I am now. No, I was not in the country. In fact, when the first T when the TRC opened, I was on home leave. I was still working at the UN. I remember driving through on the morning through Port Elizabeth, not Port, East London, from the Eastern Cape where I had visited, coming back to Cape Town. And there, I mean, was the, the spectacle. And uh, my thoughts, you know, the way I worked indirectly with the TRCs because of the radio programs we were doing at the, at the, at the, at the, at the United Nations, looking, that was the, you know, the completion of our work as the, as the radio program, the United Nations, uh, uh, the South Africa, you know, anti-apartheid radio programs that we were coming to an end in June. So the TRC came towards the end. So it was a, a focus, but I have used, I have referenced the TRC in subsequent uh, writing, both in essays and in, 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 in the stories I write because it's very meaningful to me that there was this whole big thing that the whole world applauded. But inside the country, although it was much, there was much written about it, it really wasn't hijacked, but the focus was what I, on what I call the stars of apartheid. Mm -hmm. If you had not been on Robben Island or had no relative on Robben Island or nobody in your family got murdered or that, if something terribly, terribly horrendous had not happened to you, it was as if you had not been oppressed. My question is, how did people land on Robben Island if there, there was not, you know, if everybody else was okay? And this is not to say it was not useful, but I think it, it just touched on the tip of the iceberg and the iceberg is still sitting there on our shoulders, on our heads. And unless, you know, I, I wish it had been expanded. Yeah. So that more and more people felt they were included. That's for me is where we fell short. We, we stopped too soon. Anyway, yeah. I, I've addressed this in essays. Yeah, I, I, um, I, can yeah, I just come in there? I, I would um, so like to agree with everything that Sindiwe has just said. We always said when we were doing the play that we were taking the theatricality out of the TRC. And our play was as simple as the TRC was not in the way that it was so sensationalized and so theatrical. And um, one of the lines from the play that, that I always sit with is the past is in the present and no one seems to be responsible for putting it there. 
And I don't feel that the TRC, the objective of the TRC was really to, to, to grapple with the past and find out why the past is in the present and no one seems responsible for putting mm. it there. It, um, we traveled the play to a lot of um, uh, community halls all over the country and really had discussions and people sort of took over the play and, and spoke about some of the things that um, Cindy Wey was talking about that they would never get to the TRC. The TRC yeah. never got to them. Um, so I, I uh, agree with everything you said, and that's certainly what our play was about. We were grappling with the issue of what is reconciliation, yeah, and well, was yeah. the government trying to throw a blanket of reconciliation over the country? Well, that wasn't going to work. You know, I totally agree with everything you've said, Bobby, and I can see on Yvette's face that she's feeling something a little bit similar. And I think that the TRC has had a, it had a mixed reception at the time. It has had a bit, bit of a bad rap. It was a learning curve of epic proportions. I think nobody quite knew where they were going with it. It was, it was, it, it was a million and one things. There was so much hope, so much disappointment. It was filled with stories and testimonies one way or another, but you know, it's a part of history for a lot of the, for the young people that we're talking about now. They weren't even born then. It's it's already behind us. So in a way, I want to sort of leave it to one side. And it was a very good starting point for us. But I think, you know, all these years on, I'm coming to you, Cindy, where all these years on, we maybe need to look again at the word reconciliation and what does it really mean? But before I lead that, lead us down that path, Cindy, where you wanted to say? Un unmute, unmute. I do want to say the one good thing about the TRC is that no one in their right mind could ever say apartheid didn't happen and it, it was not evil. Indeed, indeed, except perhaps W. de Klerk, but let's leave that aside. So, um, just going back to the word reconciliation and reconciliation implies that there has to be some sort of conflict and conflict can be many, many things. Yvette, just in your, in your view, reconciliation, you do a lot of work with young people. When you say, let's talk about reconciliation, or in fact, the work that you do, you, you touch on a lot of emotions, a lot of concepts that young people may not think about. But the word reconcili reconciliation itself what, what do young people feel about that word? How do they deal with that word? I mean, I think that the word reconciliation has become, it's become very tainted in many ways. Um, you know, so certainly young people who are um, politically uh, attuned are, are rejecting the word, frankly. And so I, I like to come at it from different points of view. I like to think about what, well, what are the elements of, what, what, what in fact we mean by reconciliation? What are the elements of it? You know, and for me, it's, it's really about, it's about listening, it's about empathy, it's about acknowledgement of wrongs done. It's about taking, uh, it's about accountability. Um, so it's almost as though we need to break it down into the kind of action points that are required for real reconciliation to happen. Um, and I think that um, certainly in the work that we do, we try and activate young people to, um, to put themselves into the shoes of another person, to understand the conflict from, from multiple points of view, to see why, what might have motivated people to act the way that they act, and to think about what the possible consequences would be of allowing this to fester or to remain a kind of a poisonous, um, you know, chalice that, they, that, they, that everyone is holding on to. I think for me, the biggest thing about reconciliation, the word reconciliation, is that it's really about healing. It's about, and it's about unity. It's about the bringing together and the mending. The, and that can really only happen if, um, if there's also a sense of, of freeing oneself from whatever it is that, it, that has been hurting one or that one has done, whether it's the guilt that one's carrying or the, the pain that one's carrying. You know? So um, reconciliation becomes a kind of a healthy choice if you are really wanting to be a um, someone who is whole and who is able to function in the world, but I don't think that we I don't, I don't start there. I would start at the other end, <laughs> in a sense, and and then get to to that understanding. 
Yes, I, I hear what you say about freeing oneself um, and it's about healing and uniting, but as long as one doesn't have to sacrifice one's beliefs to reconcile, I, I think that, that, could, that could be a, a potentially dangerous area. But the thing about reconciliation, because of the TRC, there's been a tendency to think of it in terms of black and white, reconciling political beliefs, reconciling, um, but it's also to do with things that are much closer to home, reconciling enemies who maybe live in the same street, reconciling family members to one another. And Cindy, we're even more basically, I think that you believe that reconciliation starts with the self. Do you want to just unmute yourself and tell us about that? Thank you, Nancy. Reconciliation is about, you know, being aware of oneself as part of the totality of humanity. Mother to mother comes from that stance. You know that the village, which is where the mother of, of the killer comes from, that tradition that when you've done wrong, you own up and you go and apologize. That was the, the, the tradition in the, in the village, you know, that, you know, the villages, nobody was going to move away because there was conflict. You had to take the necessary steps to, you know, to mend what was broken so that it didn't happen that each time two people met, there was a fight. There was one river from where to fetch the water, one, one forest from where to fetch the wood. You couldn't live in a village with conflict. When the conflict is part of human nature, we're always fighting about something, disagreeing, and there are different levels. But when there is conflict, humanity, Ubuntu, demands that you mend it as quickly as possible. That's where the mother of the killer comes from, in mother to mother, but I seem to be, you know, reconciling something, you know, in, in the work I do. In Beauty's Gift, the woman who's dying of AIDS has to accept, reconcile with this as she's been living a lie, and then grow out of her pain to embrace her friends so that they are saved from a sin. That's, that's love. You know, in the novel that's coming out, there is a, a woman who employs another. And because she lives with a, you know, bad feeling about the family where she married, you know, she, you know, the father-in-law was a bigot, the husband wasn't, but inherited some strain. And so towards the end of her life, she does something that is kind of, you know, in the strain of not compensation, but making some redress to the people or person she employed because of, that's reconciliation, uh, you know, owning up as Yvette said, to how you feel you deviated from what is right and then making amends. But that's part of life, human yeah. life, you know, relationships in the home, mother, children, husband, wife, and the, the wider community. We yeah. need to do it on a daily basis almost. Yes, and, and we need to, you know, talking in, in terms of reconciling yourself with your own issues, whatever they may be, your guilt, your, your pain, your difficulties, your ill health, that, that comes first. But I want to move to the issue that we, we're really here to talk about, which is teaching reconciliation in schools. And I just want to say to festival goers, anybody who would like to join in the conversation, please do go to the Q&A at the bottom and we, we will certainly address all your questions. So teaching reconciliation in schools. Um, when I thought about that, I thought, how? Through which discipline? I mean, there's a curriculum at school. I mean, it's a long time since I was at school, so I don't know what that curriculum looks like. But does one teach it through history? Does one teach it through the arts? Does one teach it as part of life orientation? Um, Yvette, give us your thoughts. Well, I think I think it needs to be part of uh, of all education. So yes, I think you you would be teaching it through all of those things. You could also be teaching it through literature. You you know you can be teaching it through. Frankly, you can be teaching it in the way you set an example as a teacher in the classroom, and the way you manage conflict in whatever uh, class you happen to be giving. So I don't think that it is something that needs to be. It certainly has 
points that it, it, it is touched on in different um, subjects, but ultimately it should be a way of being in the world. It should be a way that uh, schools embrace in terms of how they manage conflict, how they um, deal with whatever issues might come up. Um, you know, I look at the kinds of issues that we've had recently with the Brackenfell High situation, for example, and so many others, you know, there are so many issues that, that really need an ongoing kind of um, reconciliatory-like process, which would engage not just the learners and the teachers, but also the parents, the wider community, um, leaders from the community, artists from outside. I really think that schools are a kind of a the beautiful thing about a school is that it's like a little, um, it is a village, you know, it connects so many people. Um, and so it's a wonderful space to really make social change happen. Um, but having said that, the curriculum does, in fact, both teach the TRC within history, and it looks at mother to mother within the English curriculum, and it um, teaches within life skills all the way from the intermediate phase up, things like uh, conflict resolution, reconciliation, um, you know, uh, engaging uh, in, in a sort of productive ways of managing things. Now, of course, the question is, how are we doing that? And are we doing it well enough? <laughs> you know, and I think that's really where the interesting conversations can be had. But the fact is that there are many opportunities in the curriculum for us to be teaching reconciliation. Yeah. And who is doing it? I like your point that you made there about uh, role modeling, about setting an example, about handling conflict, whether it's a teacher or a head, a head man or, or woman, whatever. Um, and, and I suppose what's important is whatever children are learning at home, at school, what they're learning at home is even more important. So it's actually, it's, it's something that the parents need to be working on as well and asking themselves, what example am I setting? Um, We'll come back to that um, because there's a wonderful quote by Nelson Mandela who says, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can learn to love. So where are children learning these conflict situations and are they equally being taught how to resolve them? But Bobby, I'd just like to find out a little bit more about what you do, because I think that you don't work directly with schools, but I think in the broader picture, your organization, um, Metlo Maya, is very much about uh, teaching good things like reconciliation through the arts. Do you want to just expand on that? Um, I think that um, for us, it's very important to unpack reconciliation. So. We, I would say we don't promote reconciliation because I really believe that, you know, you can talk about reconciliation at different levels, obviously personal level, the psychological level, et cetera. But in terms of national reconciliation, which if we go back to the TRC, that was the attempt to promote it. And certainly post 1994 was promoting reconciliation. But if you look at the incredible material and economic disparity in the country, how on earth can you sort of be promoting reconciliation? So I think we have to go right back to history and material conditions in terms of our approach to issues like reconciliation. So um, in Mechlomaya, I mean, of course, we, we want to project the eye to the sun in the work that we do, you know. But um, we also believe that th there's an incredible need for understanding context, understanding historical context. And I think young people who I have dealt with are simply furious. They've inherited um, a, a very dislocated um, society with incredible economic and material disparity. And they are told that they must reconcile. Well, no, you know. Um, so it goes back to, I think it was Sindiwe was saying um, when we were talking about the, the, um, the, the discussion before, it goes back to history. And you were asking where to place um, uh, issues around reconciliation. I think we have to be very careful with the way in which history is taught at school. 
Um, I've seen very progressive history books and I've seen history books that are quite liberal and gloss over the real issues in the society. So for me, um, the work that we do rather attempts to break down before we can even begin to build. But yeah. really we have to challenge much deeper structural uh, damage in the society before yeah. we can talk about reconciliation. That's an interesting point you made about a lot of the young people that you work with being angry and bitter and frustrated. I uh, just want to read a, a message that we've had from Facebook. Lorraine Sitole says, reconciliation, own up and apologize. She says, I love both Mother to Mother and Beauty's Gift, phenomenally narrated stories by Mama Cindy Way. That little accolade for you there, Cindy Way. Um, but Bobby, it seems to me that the young people, the you know, young people that you're talking about may be a little bit older. Cindy Way, I know that you work a lot with very little children, and I'm wondering at what point one starts the need to teach reconciliation. Do we start in primary school, high school, university, or do we start in the creche? Cindy Way, your thoughts? Unmute yourself. As early as possible. Hmm. Children come to us innocent. Children don't know anything, but they have they have the ability to learn from day one. It is what we teach them. And when I hear, and I know this is true, how angry the you know, youth is today, that's what their children will inherit. That's what they will learn from them. And we have dropped the ball, really. If we allow this anger and hate to go on, what's the point? The joy, the promise of 1994, this whole democracy we have of freedom, whatever you want to live, is nullified. Nothing has changed if we allow hate to go on and on. We did not appreciate the gift that we were given. The chance of a lifetime, some lifetimes don't get it, to remake a nation. Are we doing this? No, we are allowing the same things we learned from our parents, the anger, the hate, the distrust, the, we are giving that to our children, but it is multiplied now because there's no longer any apathy. Where I might have understood, not liked, not accepted why I was poor. My children and my grandchildren have no idea why they're poor. There's no apathy, you know, but they have inherited what I can we have not addressed it as a nation. It's appalling. And reconciliation should start from pre-birth. We should be minding our children. Pre-birth, we are not doing it. Look at the prisons. The money we are not spending on little children, we're spending on mending broken people. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but it, it's, 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 it's a thankless job and the return is not as rich as we would have if we had planted the money at the front edge of a person's life. Where are we? Where are we all, the four of us here and others like us? Why are we letting this yeah. go on? I think what I'm hearing you say is that this is all our responsibilities. It's not something that we need to land on the doorstep of the schools, that schools will sort it out. Schools must do this, the government must do this. We all need to take responsibility. And we talked about through which vehicle, through which part of the curriculum should that be happening. Yvette, you say a wonderful thing as um, not just as Asitej director, but also um, with your Free Boys productions, you say a wonderful thing. Uh, and it brings us back to using the arts as a way of teaching reconciliation and all sorts of other things you say, Theatre gives children a different kind of experience that engages them with every cell and every part of their being and mm. is profoundly transformative. Mm. We can hear our parents saying things, we can hear the teachers saying things, we can read things in books. But when you, when as a child, as a young person, you see something happening on a stage and mm. in the documentary of Mother to Mother, we see young people, they're 14, 15, 16, watching Tembi and Charlie Jones pouring out her grief, um, you can see something happening to them that's completely internalized. Um, it's almost like they have no choice. They're, they're taking us on, they're feeling it. 
it, it feels like theater, film, um, the art somehow is a very good vehicle. It just how can we do it so that children or young people don't feel that they're being preached at? Well, I think, I think you know, precisely because the arts give us another way of seeing, another way of experiencing, um, if it's good theatre, I'm not saying all theatre, of course, because there is dreadfully preachy theatre too. Um, but, you know, if the, if the theatre is really made with integrity and, and real um, creativity and care, you can, you can, open worlds for children and young people in ways that don't feel in any way alienating because you have that human connection. And the other thing is that it's a very visceral experience. You know, it, you, you are breathing with the characters on stage. You're in the same space as them. They, they are right there. And one of the things that we found so powerful, both with Mother to Mother and with um, Truth and Translation, was having the actors themselves, and I'm sure Bobby would agree with this, um, having the actors themselves being able to interact with the audience after the production or before the production sometimes. We did workshops both before and after and those kinds of ex experiences are incredibly powerful because yeah. you've not just seen this person sort of take flight on stage, you know, and move you and um, and, and sort of pull on your, on, on every, you know, part of your humanity but you are now in conversation with this person and you're able to, in, in our case, we did a lot of very practical workshops. You're able to play with these people. You're able to, you're on the same level as these people and you're able to hear personal experiences from these people. And that, that connection, that very human connection, I think makes for profound change in a way that a dry history lesson or you know, something else could never ever do. So I really firmly believe that the arts have to be used as a, as a method, as a, as a mechanism for unlocking real learning that is about more than just the, the mind, but it's also about the heart, body and spirit. Bobby, abs absolutely, Yvette, I totally hear you on all of the above. Um, Bobby, with the story I'm about to tell, did you also have workshops afterwards? And is workshopping afterwards something that you, um, that you support or advocate? Oh, yes. Oh yes, definitely. Um, um, we did, um, uh, uh, I just wanted to say that the play ran for five years from 97 to 2001. So it ran almost the whole time that the TRC took place. Um, we would perform for one hour and then we would have a, dis a debate. Um, the audience, um, as Yvette says, it's very exciting for audiences to then be able to engage with actors. But because we use three people um, in the play, I shouldn't say use three people in the play, there were three people in the play who had told their stories of the TRC. Much of the discussion was with the, um, th those people. Um, and sometimes that our discussion would go on for three hours, um, just around debating particularly the issue of reconciliation uh, um, against economic uh, conditions. But uh, just to agree with Yvette, I think theater is so powerful. I think sometimes theater doesn't even know itself is so powerful. And the, the fact that people are sitting watching something that's real but not quite real is a very liberating experience, I believe, because um, people are free to make of it what they want to make of it, you know, it's, um, it's just very liberating. Um, so I think theatre should be used so much more in every possible space. I, I really think it's remarkable. And um, just in terms of the curriculum and in terms of students, um, I found that students, young people respond so incredibly passionately um, to theatre and having those debates and workshops is critical. So yes, no, I definitely support it. But I just wanted to say something um, to um, Sindiwe that what I liked about Mother to Mother, I didn't read the book, but I saw the play, was that it dealt with a very brave um, engagement between two mothers. And it was about reconciliation on an individual level. And I think 
you know, our play dealt very much with the blanket of reconciliation that was supposed to fall over the country post-1994. So we dealt very much at that sort of political level with reconciliation. But I found Mother to Mother to be an incredibly intriguing piece because of these two women who engaged um, and, and dealt with the very, very hard issues that they were faced with around reconciliation. So I really thought that was a very courageous piece of work. And um, um, Bobby, I must tell you that we, when we talked about the mother to mother earlier in the week, we talked about Tembi and Charlie Jones's uh, performance. And there was one evening where actually Linda Beale, Amy Beale's mother was in the audience. And I think, um, it was, Janice Honeyman was saying it, it was electric. You could, you could feel the passion that was going between the two mothers. And I mean, you know, personal on, a, on another level altogether. Um, and I want to say, you know, with those workshops, the one hour that turns into three hours, I think is anybody taking notes? Is anybody harnessing all this invaluable material? But, you know, one thing that is missing from this particular debate is the voice of young people themselves. And we're talking, we are saying, this is what should happen in schools. And Sindhuo, one of the things that came out of the documentary about Mother to Mother was those wonderful conversations that, that some of the kids were having between themselves around, you know, in the library or, you know, one-to-one. -one. It, it, was, it was beyond moving. And I thought that, um, you know, I think that's where we've really got to look for the grains of truth, whatever they are learning at home or learning at school, it helps them to talk it through. When you were talking to those young people, when you were addressing the school children who had been using Mother to Mother as a set work, what were their responses? What did they come back to you with? The amazing thing, Nancy, about young people is how ready they are to grow, to become what they were meant to be. Despite what they are going through, they just need a little nudge, a little helping hand, a, a, you know, a poem, a, a play, something that opens their eyes. And earlier you asked me about the group I, I worked with in, um, in, uh, in uh, Hermanas. It's the same with these kids, these young people at high school. The little ones and the high, they are ready. The opportunity to work with kids and to hear their stories, to, to tell, you know, do storytelling to them and have them storytell, story tell their, you know, either personal stories or stories that, and read and write and do games and play with them. You wouldn't believe me when I'm playing with kids. But all it is, is to you know, open a window of opportunity to this child to realize there is a little bit more to life than the misery and drudgery and filth and abuse and hunger that, and that their lives need not be like that always. To give them hope, a glimmer of hope so that they can know that everyone is unique, including them. Everyone is, is here for a reason, including them. And it is their duty to become active in becoming what they were meant to. They must look for help. It's always there, but you must look, find people, find ways. And that's the story at the high school, that look at what happened despite apartheid. You have it in you. Talk to your grown-ups, the grown-ups around you. If your parents fail or don't know, talk to the preacher, talk to the teacher, talk to anybody. Find people on Google, but always with the help of somebody responsible. Find a grown-up you can trust. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, grown-ups that are trustworthy are not to a penny, unfortunately. We're all, we're all very flawed as parents and as, and as adults. And the, the group of children you're talking about, they're called the Sparkle Kids, and they're very lucky to have you to help them sparkle and to retain that sparkle. But, you know, as children get older, they become, they are victims of all sorts of things. Girl children in particular are victims of abuse, of, the, of poverty, of all sorts of things. And that's when it becomes more difficult. Yvette, I was saying to Bobby about, does anybody take notes when these young people are having conversations? Because what they have to say 
is is eye opening because they come with honesty. They come with whatever it is that they've learned at home, you know. And and schools are hotbeds of bullying too. So reconciliation couldn't be more important. What's what's your take on the conversations that young people have uh, in the workshopping or the the debate and the discussion after plays? Well, I mean, I think that um, obviously, you know, it, it depends on who's facilitating the conversations as to how they see those conversations being taken forward. But certainly in the work that we were doing with Truth and Translation and also with um, Mother to Mother and in, you know, other similar kinds of, of situations. Um, for us, it's incredibly important that young people feel that their voice is important, that they feel like they are being heard. I think that one of the things that, that, that feeds that anger that Bobby was describing is not just the fact that material conditions haven't changed, but that they feel powerless to make change and they feel like no one's listening. And so I think it's absolutely you know, vital that, that, we are, that we do listen and that we find ways to listen. And one of the things that, that I found very powerful is having young people to kind of um, be inspired by whatever it is that we have made and presented to them and that, you know, that, that has got them thinking and talking and engaging with it uh, to make their own work, to, to come back to us and to show us, well, what is your reality? What are the, what are the conflicts that you're dealing with? You know, and whether that comes in a written form, a drawn form for younger children, um, a, an acted form, you know, we have so many um, theater groups that start as a result of a production being taken to a school and then you start this conversation, they are involved in the workshop, they do some acting exercises and they suddenly see the power of it. And they see that they can tell their own story this way. And so, you know, I think that, I think really encouraging young people to have a voice is is vital and to and and then to listen you know how do we then take those views seriously how do we take the solutions because often young people are very creative they've got brilliant solutions to the to the obstacles that they are facing yeah. um but no one's listening well sometimes it's because they can't i mean i think about the average school if there's such a thing exists in south africa and teachers can be very overburdened with all kinds of issues not to mention covid on top of it all so you know, we, we saw in the documentary, the mother to mother documentary, we saw um, one of the teachers reading, reading from the book and having the children turn to the page and etc. But it, you know, it's not every teacher that she may be having grief at home, he, she may be having grief at home. It's not every teacher that comes with the sort of compassion that Cindy is describing. But I come back to what is actually happening in schools and over and above a piece of theatre how else can reconciliation be taught? Yvette, just to continue with you, I know that you've been working with life skills with the Department of Basic Education. Just tell yes. us how that pans out. So that's, that's a really interesting project because basically what's happened is that the, Depart the National Department of Basic Education has decided that they want to create a national textbook for life skills. And in the production of this textbook, um, they are looking at life skills from grade R right through to matric they have been identifying the sort of thematic threads that, that run through from literally as a child enters the schooling system to when they leave. And they're looking at how do we build the identity of the child? How do we, um, you know, how do we age appropriately um, allow the child to engage with the society and the societal issues around them? Um, and what they've also done, which I think is, um, is really extraordinary, is that they've employed the arts as method across life skills. So at the moment, uh, creative arts is a part of life skills at the intermediate phase. But after that, it separates out, it becomes its own subject. So at senior phase, you've, you've studied two art forms. It's a compulsory thing in schools, which is wonderful. We have totally endorsed that. And then from grade 10 onwards, you are able to choose an art form if you would like to for your matric subject. And of course, most schools don't offer the arts. So this is only for those lucky enough to have that access. But now the arts are there as a methodology for the entire life skills cur curriculum, for personal and social well-being, for environmental health, for gender-based violence, for it all. So in fact, what we now really need to be doing is upskilling teachers and having artists support teachers to be able to use the arts for uh, you know, in a, in a productive way for those other conversations and other areas of the curriculum. So I think we are at a very exciting moment. The textbooks are being completed. They're going to be in schools very soon. 
Um, and I think that it's a moment that the arts community needs to galvanize around and really support arts in uh, schools in delivering this through the yeah. arts. Gosh, that book will be invaluable for everybody, I'm sure. I mean, to get hold of a national textbook for life skills, I think we all need it um, at whatever age. This is, a, this is a bit of a segue, but Bobby, I want to come back to you for where you began by saying, by talking in solidarity with all those artists, all the people in the arts who are, you know, go to confront the NAC. Uh, it's the 18th day that they've been thinking about it. And what you have all been saying is one way or another, how important the arts are as a vehicle for teaching all sorts of things, not just reconciliation. And yet the arts are, scarcely or rather under taught at schools. So why would any one young person want to go into the arts when they're probably not going to get a job? Their parents probably say, like Tembi and Charlie Jones, her parents nearly died when she said she wanted to be an actress. They said, that's rubbish. I know it was a generation or two ago, but there's still that feeling of the arts, it doesn't pay. So how, how are we to reconcile the, the use of the arts in all the wonderful things that they have to offer with the fact that nobody can afford to be an artist. It, it, you know, where do we go with that? <laughs> That's, a That's a trick question. <laughs> Look, I think a lot has to be done by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture to promote the arts, to promote the incredible possibilities of theatre and arts. And it's really interesting to hear um, about the curriculum, we once using art as method and theatre as method, and one hopes that gets used appropriately, and not only in um, privileged contexts. Um, it's a it's it's a hard question, but it it's uh, how, I, I don't know what you say to parents about it, but um, theatre has to continue to exist and all art forms have to continue to exist. And we've got to get a government that promotes um, art across the board. Um, everyone sits and listens to music all day, but they never stop to think that there's an artist behind the making of the music. I mean, imagine if one shut down all art all over the world for an hour. Mm. Yet people don't think about the artist making the art. So, I mean, to answer your question about will they get jobs, I think we've got to start turning it around and making sure that there are more jobs in art. But I wanted to pick up on a point that Yvette was saying that, um, you know, by taking theatre out of theatre spaces and into all sorts of other spaces, that's an incredibly um, effective way of promoting um, new theatre groups to start up, new art groups to start up. Um, and I think we have to do a lot more than that. But a lot more needs to happen in the schools because that's where we're creating a future audience. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've might... answered your question. It's too difficult. Well, you haven't, but you've, you've expanded on the difficulty. Um, and I think that that's what we're very conscious of. And maybe that's what we need to be teaching. Maybe we need to be teaching the potential for the arts with all the gifts that an art an arts education comes with. Yvette, just to come back to you quickly on in, in terms of young people moving into the arts, ACITEJ is the International Association of Theatre for Children and Young People. How many, with the work that you do, how many young people are inspired to not just enjoy it for when they're a young person, but to move into it as a profession? Oh, that's a very difficult thing to measure because, um, you know, our, our beneficiaries rate in the hundreds of thousands every year, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how many of those necessarily go into the arts. Um, I, I mean, I think that we have there are a lot of people entering the arts, you know, generally. I think at the moment, right now, because of COVID, um, the arts have become an incredibly uh, difficult space. And, you know, and so people are perhaps thinking twice about that. But for me, the real value of the arts is not to make more artists, although, of course, we will always need artists. But it's really about the enrichment that it brings to every human being. And it is, in fact, a vital method of learning. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the natural form of learning, you know, how children play is how they learn. And the arts are simply an extension of play. That's what the arts are. 
So um, I think that we need to be looking at this from a different point of view. And I would agree that DSAC, uh, Department of Sports, Science and Culture, needs to do a lot more. But I also think that, in fact, we need to be looking at a cross-sectoral kind of engagement, because if we're going to produce young people who are able to be creative thinkers and critical um, problem solvers and good communicators and all the things that the 21st century is telling us are needed as 21st century skills, actually the best way to teach those skills is the arts. It doesn't matter whether you're going to become Bill Gates or whether you're going to become, you know, whatever you are, the, the um, whether you go into business, whether you go into government, whether you go into, uh, you know, a, a shop or whatever, it doesn't matter. The arts are going to serve you because they are going to um, engage you with critical thinking, with communication skills, with a sense of yourself, um, you know, with this, what uh, Cindy was talking about earlier in terms of that sense of belonging, that sense of being connected, being whole, being recognized. Um, so actually they are vital, they are absolutely vital and we need to be getting the other industries to, to realize that, that without the arts, there will be no 4IR, for example, in South Africa, you know, we'll be left behind. Yeah, you know, we're talking, we talk about the arts with a big capital A and we're focusing a lot on theatre and film, but I just want to, Cindy, I want to kind of give you the last word because one of the arts is, is the wonderful art of writing, which is the time of the writer festival is all about. And one thing that every child can do, providing they've got a stick and a piece of sand to write in, is write. And you were talking uh, earlier about the young children who like to tell their stories and share their stuff. And the very most simple form of, of expressing yourself is through writing, you know, however difficult it may be physically to write. But is there something there? I mean, you yourself used writing as a means of expressing yourself quite early on. Uh, well, not very early on in your life, but writing came to you like a gift. Is that a gift that we could really be passing on to a lot more children as a means of expressing themselves? Just unmute yourself. Thank you. I, I, I thank you for that question, Nancy. I sincerely hope that this panel and all the artists listening or who will listen later on can take that question seriously. We need as a nation to help the young people find their voices. We need to listen. We need to encourage them to express what it is they feel, what it is they need and, and meet them halfway. And one of the things as, as, as um, we just had, Yvette say, is that children can write their stories. They can, you know, and act what they feel. Little stories, little playlets, but is who, who am, this is the story I want to tell, as Bobby said. Everybody has a story to tell. It doesn't matter if it's a happy story, a sad story, a funny story, tell it. And we need to listen. We gathered in Hermanas all the some about 50 stories, and someone is printing them for us free of charge. And I hope I'll get a copy and I'll share with you what I get. But you know, for a child to hold a book where they can see their own story, I think that's marvelous. That really is. It has to be encouraged. And upscaling teachers, Yvette, is crucial. We know where our, you know, where the education system is, you know throughout the country, the, the beautiful book you have put together will not serve anything if the teacher cannot use it well or even half well, you know, and I'm not putting down teachers. I was a primary school teacher and a high school teacher myself. A lot has to do with the trait. You cannot give what you don't have. Let me put it that way. You cannot give what you don't have. Let's, let's make this happen. It's there, you, you know, kids are ready we must get our act together. Thank you. I, that's a wonderful way in which to close. I think the expression is when the pupil is ready, the teacher appears. Maybe we need the teachers to be ready and the pupils will jump up and down for joy. Cindy, if only everybody had you as a teacher, the world would be a happier, joyful, more joyful place. And I think I just a, a word for anybody listening now, if they would like to listen to it again, if you only came in later, you'll find it on the Time of the Writer Facebook page, but also on Twitter and YouTube. So this is accessible 
Bobby, Yvette, Cindy, Way, it, I feel that there is so much more, there's so much that could be done to help our young people, because as Cindy Way says, if, if our young people are in crisis, where are we going? Um, and we can't have that. We need the arts, we need all of the work that you three are doing to be escalated and acknowledged and promoted. So thank you very much, it's been wonderful. Cindy Wimagwana, author of Mother to Mother, amongst many other things, Yvette Hardy of Asitej and many other things, and Bobby Rodwell of, we didn't give you a chance to tell us a little bit more about Mechlo Maya, but if anybody wants to Google it, I'm sure they can find out more. So thank you all very much. Do, um, as it were, stay tuned later on. I'm going to be back talking to uh, Patrick Tariq Mellet, to Nick Mflongo and to uh, Shafinaz Hassim, which is very exciting. So I'll be back just now at around seven o'clock. So till then, lovely, bless you all. And thank you for your time.